uh, this is a topic that some of you know is near and dear to my heart. Um, so I am a, a breast medical oncologist with MD Anderson Cooper. I also head up the integrative oncology department. Um, I am board certified in hematology, medical oncology, but also in integrative medicine. So I have an interest in, in sort of, to put it simply, what else can we do outside of the standard conventional therapies, which I give every single day, like chemo, radiation, surgeries, and all the other fancy things we do. Um, today, we're going to talk about supplements, and particularly, I'm going to focus a little bit initially on, on the idea of information and how that's changed over the last couple of years and, and how we consume it, um, and then supplements. Um, obviously, this, there, there's hundreds and hundreds of supplements that are used in cancer, and there's no way we can go over every, every one, but um, I'll give you uh, some sources. Hello? You can hear me. Yes, Dr. Um, okay. Meadow. I just okay. want to kindly ask everyone to please mute themselves. I hear background noise. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Meadow. Um, so we'll focus on what I think are a few supplements that have evidence and um, All right, I apologize. It keeps muting me, kind of like my wife does at home. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, okay. All right. I guess you'll control the slides, Roxanne. Yes, sir. I will control. All right, next slide. All right. So we'll just start briefly. This is my, my story, which... Uh, began um, about 40 years ago uh, when I emigrated uh, to the United States. I was six years old. Uh, I grew up in New York City. We lived in a, a one-bedroom apartment where the four of us, my sister and my parents, slept in the bedroom, and my grandmother slept in the living room. And I still remember every morning getting up, coming out of the bedroom, and my grandmother would have this concoction waiting for me. Uh, this was whole milk crushed almonds that she actually used a mortar and pestle for, um, and turmeric. And she would tell me that it would give me strength and clean my blood. Uh, so, so more on that um, in a bit. Next slide. Uh, so flash forward uh, to a few years back. Uh, this is a, a patient who uh, was 37 years old when I met her. Uh, she was near the end of her pregnancy and suddenly noticed a red swollen breast and was diagnosed with what's known as inflammatory breast cancer. Um, that is a somewhat of an emergency in terms of treatment. So we induced her. We gave her extensive chemotherapy. Um, she had a double mastectomy. She had radiation. She was found to have a genetic um, condition that predisposed her to having breast and ovarian cancer. So she also had her ovaries removed and she started on medication, had a reconstruction, had problems with that. Next slide. And then two years later, um, she's doing well from a cancer standpoint, but unfortunately, as you can see here, lots of other issues related to emotional problems, physical issues from, from treatment. She never felt that she bonded with her baby. Um, she calls her chest a gunshot wound because her implant failed and had to be removed. She's gained weight. Her heart function has dropped, and um, unfortunately, her family had filed for bankruptcy. Next slide. So is she healthy? And this is something I, I think about a lot as an oncologist. What does it mean to be healthy? This is her PET scan, the clean PET scan. Um, but what does it mean? Next slide. So we go back to the World Health Organization, which defined health as a state of complete physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Next slide. And this quest for health uh, is as old as human beings. At each age of humanity, the first you know, 10,000 years of the Neolithic age, the next few hundred years of the scientific age, the next few hundred years of the industrial age, and now particularly these last 50 years of what we now call the information age. Next slide. 
So along with this, we're seeing a rise in both the incidence and prevalence of various diseases, particularly cancer. Uh, people ask me every day, why, why is this? Why are we seeing more cancer? I don't think there's one answer necessarily, but um, we're seeing that people are getting more tests just for lots of reasons. Every time they go to the emergency room or go to their doctor, another test is ordered and we're finding things that maybe we weren't meant to find. We're, we're uh, seeing that the population is getting older. The median life expectancy 100 years ago was about 50, 55, so many people just weren't getting old enough to have cancer. Uh, more people are surviving with cancer, cured from cancer, and even those with stage four cancer are living longer, healthier lives. Next slide. So there is this perfect storm of information and incidents. And so that is resulting in what I'm calling a global pandemic. And it's not COVID, it is misinformation. And this pandemic is killing scores of people and many with underlying medical conditions like cancer. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, my screen froze up on me, wait a minute, okay. Okay. <laughs> Not. Okay. So, so what are the causes and effects of misinformation? Well, the first um, is the dilution of expertise. So if everyone's an expert, no one's an expert. And this is happening everywhere. And, and this is an example of the fact that I'm completely guilty of it. Uh, about a year ago, <laughs> I thought I could replace my own toilet uh, rather than spending a few hundred bucks and calling the expert. I went on YouTube, I said, I know how to do this, I'm a smart guy, I went to Lowe's, got the tools that I have no idea, I've never used before, and I tried. And unfortunately, it didn't work, um, led to a much more expensive outcome and some spousal arguments at home. Next slide. The other thing that we're seeing is this idea of observation and causation. The fact that two things happen at the same time does not mean that one causes the other. Um, this is actually most prevalent in um, sort of uh, the, what we call the, the VAERS database, which is a COVID database for illness uh, and side effects from vaccines. Um, we, we see that when people get vaccinated, um, they also tend to have other problems because as you start reporting hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people that get vaccinated, a lot of those people are just going to have problems because they're People have health issues. People die. About uh, several hundred thousand people a month are dying just naturally. And so we are associating things that maybe weren't necessarily meant to be associated. Next slide. And the third thing is this Brandolini's law, and I apologize for the vulgarity, but um, it's true that you know the old adage of a, a lie can get around the world before the truth has a chance to tie its shoes. Next slide. And then finally, how we get information. So we know from the Pew Research that one website accounts for almost 50% of the information that, that we get. And so we have these algorithms that feed us information that we're looking for. I, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but try to just for a couple of days, just search for one thing, um, you know, puppies, and you'll see, you'll just get puppy videos. Um, so it's not like the algorithms have any sinister motive, it's just they want to feed you what they think you want to see. And this, of course, leads to polarization and tribalism and confirmation bias and echo chambers. And, and this um, translates into, into healthcare, particularly those with dangerous health conditions. Next slide. And so ultimately, it leads to rational discussions on all sides of an issue that get silenced. And when we question our own tribe, it's heresy. So the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. And we see this in integrative medicine where there are, there are many facets of integrative medicine that have data that, that seem to help people, but uh, they get thrown out because they're associated with some of the, the crazy things that, that we see. Next slide. This is a segue, bad pun, next slide. Um, so let's talk about cancer and integrative health. We know that patients with a cancer diagnosis seek out 
integrative and complementary therapies at an incredibly high rate, upwards of 80 to 85 percent of people with a cancer diagnosis. Why do they do it? Three main reasons. They are looking to help their symptoms, they're looking to improve immune function, and then they're also looking to improve their cancer outcomes. So when it comes to things like nutrition and physical activity and mind-body practices and emotional health, there's really no controversy about those things. And most practitioners and patients um, uh, know that there's some value without much risk. But when it comes to supplements, that's when most of the, uh, the debates happen. Next slide. So supplements have been used for thousands of years, and, and today we use them for lots of things. For example, St. John's wort for depression, fish oil we use for cholesterol management, cranberry uh, for UTIs, and, and the scores of other things. Next slide. This woman is now 91 years old. She won the Nobel Prize in medicine about six years ago for her discovery of artemisin. So she has no PhD nor MD, and she was the lead on a study that was um, chartered by Chairman Mao, who was trying to support the North Vietnamese troops in the late 60s during the Vietnam War, as they were all dying of malaria. And she figured out through this ancient text that she translated that the wormwood plant had some, some a compound that seemed to help with this specific condition. The translation of that recipe of that chapter was actually emergency prescriptions kept up on sleeve. And so her and her team figured this out. She was the very first um, participant in the clinical trial because she felt she had to take it herself before it was safe to give to others. And artemisin today is still the most effective therapy for plasmodium falciparum, which is the most dangerous form of malaria. Next slide. In cancer, uh, some of you who are on right now uh, likely have gotten some of these compounds, particularly that first one, paclitaxel, which is taxol, comes from the Pacific yew tree. Uh, this is just an example of a couple of, of the, the medications we use in cancer that have come from, from plants. Next slide. Uh, about 30 years ago, the FDA passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. And what that act said is that supplements are to be regulated like foods, not drugs. And so the FDA can't approve dietary supplements, and that the company itself is responsible to ensure safety, which is an interesting um, incentive. Um, and it has to have a nutrition label, as many of you have seen. So, so how can you trust supplements? Um, so there are three organizations that a supplement company, company can voluntarily submit their product to to get this label. So the first one, is the U.S. Pharmacopeia, that's USP, that's probably the largest organization. The second one is the National Science Foundation, NSF, and then the third one is Consumer Labs. So if you see one of these labels, what you get is not necessarily that the supplement works, but at least that the dose on, in the bottle is the dose on the bottle and that there's no contaminants. It doesn't mean that you have to have it for for a quality supplement, but if you have it, chances are you're getting uh, the truth, at least. Next slide. So let's start with vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D uh, we get from primarily uh, three ways. The main one is actually sunlight. So when UVB light hits the skin, vitamin D is is made. So residents actually in the northern regions of the U.S. receive a lot less UVB light from November to March. So there is a higher incidence of vitamin D deficiencies in people who live in the, the northern parts of the U.S. and the northern parts of the world. Um, diet through egg yolks, fatty fish, milk, um, and then finally supplements. So the vitamin D goes into the liver, gets converted to the form that we measure in the blood, calcitriol, and then to the kidneys, the to the form that's actually most active, which is 125 uh, calcitriol. Next slide. There have been hundreds and hundreds of studies uh, with vitamin D in cancer. There, many of them have shown in labs, uh, in lab studies and animal studies, that vitamin D can inhibit the growth of malignant cells. 
in breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, it's been shown that if patients have normal levels versus subnormal levels, that normal level vitamin D can uh, decrease the risk of death. There was a large study uh, that looked at epidemiologically at this and concluded that if we just raise everyone's level to this range of 40 to 60, that we could prevent 58,000 cases of breast cancer and almost 50,000 cases of colon cancer. Um, now, like anything, uh, too much of a good thing is not a good thing, so we need to be careful not to take too much as levels greater than 100 to 150 have been associated with things like kidney stones and even dangerous uh, elevations in calcium levels. So with vitamin D, it's not so much about the dose, it's about your level. So if you're taking vitamin D, then it's probably a good idea to periodically, it could be twice a year, measure your levels. Uh, this gets complicated because lately insurance companies, Medicare in particular, um, has decided that it's not in the best interest of patients to check levels. And so um, it can get expensive. Uh, if it's not covered, I think it's about three, $400 for the test. So just make sure it's covered before, before you're testing it. Next slide. Um, there was a large trial called the VITAL trial, which looked at 25,000 healthy men and women over the age of 50. These were not people with cancer or heart or cardiovascular disease. And the study was trying to see if vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids could help, could help reduce the incidence of cancer or reduce the incidence of cardiovascular disease. And two by two factorial design means that there were four groups. One group took placebo, one group took both vitamin D and omega, one group took vitamin D and one group took the omega. Ultimately, the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, and the overall population uh, did not appear to benefit uh, from either, for either endpoint. Uh, but, next slide. As we start, as most of these large trials do, we start looking at subgroups, because usually there's certain groups that might benefit, certain groups that don't. And so the, uh, the team at Harvard uh, that, can, that consisted of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and then the T.H. Chan, Chan School of Public Health performed uh, a fairly sizable secondary analysis um, that was uh, published about two years ago that did find a significant reduction in metastatic or fatal cancer, particularly interestingly in those with a normal body mass index. Um, they're still looking into exactly what the BMI has to do with it, but we think obesity may modulate immune function in a way that somehow negates the benefit. But, but nonetheless, uh, this suggests that while the incidence of the cancer diagnosis may not necessarily be reduced, once someone has a cancer diagnosis, it may reduce the risk of, of metastases because ultimately, as, as um, I tell my patients, you know, people don't die of cancer. They die of cancer that spreads. Um, another analysis by groups at Stanford and Harvard uh, showed similar findings that, it, that vitamin D can decrease tumor invasiveness and metastases once cancer is actually there. Next paragraph, uh, next uh, slide. Um, so what about omega-3s? Uh, this is another one I get asked about a lot. Um, what are they? So there are two types. There's short chain and long chain. So short chain fatty acids are the ones that we find in vegetarian sources like flaxseed, walnuts, chia. Those aren't necessarily the kind that have most of the data when it comes to inflammation or cancer. It's the long chain, which is EPA and DHA, and it's the long chain that is almost exclusively derived from marine sources, so fish oil, krill oil. Um, if there are any strict vegans who still want long chain fatty acids, there is a, a something called algae oil that can give you that. Um, but there have been, again, numerous randomized trials of fish oil with cancer treatment that have shown beneficial effects in terms of toxicity, potentially even uh, time to progression, meaning how long it takes before a cancer may uh, get worse. Uh, there's clearly benefits when it comes to joint pains, uh, particularly those uh, related to uh, certain endocrine blockers that we use in breast cancer. Uh, it, they're actually used in many joint conditions in general. Uh, in parts of Europe, they use high-dose uh, fish oil uh, for treatment of things like rheumatoid arthritis 
or other autoimmune um, arthritic conditions. Next slide. So I, I tell patients they need to understand the difference between the dose of the fish oil and the dose of the omega-3. Um, so when, the, when we recommend 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams, we're actually talking about the dose of the omega-3. Um, this is an example where, um, and by the way, I have no um, financial stake in any supplement company nor any interest in any particular supplement. Uh, but here's an example of, of, a, of a company that's fish oil, 1,200 milligrams, but you can see there, uh, and this actually has it on the front. Uh, many of the bottles don't even have it on the front. You have to go into the back and look at the EPA and DHA dose per capsule. So you can see that only about a third of this, a uh, third to a quarter of this, is actually omega-3. Um, so, for example, if I'm recommending 2,000 milligrams, if, if someone took this, they would need, um, you know, seven of these or six of these to get to the right dose. Um, remember with omega-3s uh, that they have some blood thinning effects. Uh, they can affect platelet function and thin the blood. But it turns out you actually need fairly high doses to achieve that. So most, um, for most procedures, um, there'll be some rules around that. So if you're getting any surgery, any procedure, you should hold your fish oil uh, for at least a week um, or at least just follow whatever recommendations they're, they're giving you. Interestingly, there was a large uh, sy uh, systematic review of this that found no increase in bleeding risk. Even though there was an impact on platelets, the clinical impact from a surgical standpoint didn't seem to uh, result in, in worsening bleeding. Um, next slide. Um, this is one that comes up a lot. So this goes back to the uh, the the tasty um, drink that I used to have every morning as a child, uh, curcumin. So curcumin is the most researched active component of the spice turmeric. And there are several thousand studies of curcumin in various ailments, uh, particularly cancer and other inflammatory conditions. We think curcumin uh, it does a lot of things that particularly can decrease various inflammatory mediators, particularly something called TNF-alpha and NF-kappa-beta. Um, there's uh, evidence in patients on chemotherapy and radiation that whether you use it topically, in a paste, orally, it can protect against uh, skin issues. It can protect against the mucositis that sometimes chemotherapy can, can cause, which is this inflammation of the mucosal linings. It can even protect against something called hand foot syndrome, which is a condition that a couple of our chemo uh, drugs can cause. Um, and curcumin seems to inhibit cancer cell proliferation and metastases uh, through various mechanisms. Essentially, what it, what it seems to do is cause the cell to go into a, a, a quiescent state, which eventually leads to death of the cell. Next slide. Um, Curcumin, uh, the, the one thing you really want to be careful about with curcumin is that it inhibits uh, various enzymes of the famous uh, CYP-P450 pathway. So the cytochrome P450 is a pathway in the liver that's um, used uh, in the metabolism of, a metabolism of many medications. Um, those four in particular, uh, there's many enzymes in that pathway, but those four uh, may have a little bit more inhibition. Again, like anything, uh, we're not sure if this is clinically relevant, um, but uh, it's something you want to make sure, like any of these, you want to make sure you let your your cancer team know uh, that you're doing so they can look at it um, and make decisions about whether it's, it's safe to do. Um, it also has some antiplatelet effects, although we think much less than, than the omega-3s. Next slide. Um, probiotics is something that's actually gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, even at uh, Cooper, our gastroenterology team is doing some interesting work on the idea of the gut microbiome. Um, you know, the gut has all sorts of bacteria, and generally in a healthy gut, you have an equilibrium between the good guys and the bad guys. The, the healthy bacteria Though when you when people take uh, lots of antibiotics, chemotherapy, um, other treatments, healthy bacteria can die out faster than the more virulent bacteria. So you create this disequilibrium 
which can result in um, not just gastrointestinal problems, but we think there's an impact on immune function. And so we are doing some research right now at MD Anderson Cooper on this. We're looking at um, how the gut microbiome and the component and the makeup of the gut microbiome may actually impact treatments from um, uh, from cancer. So most probiotics contain these uh, few uh, species. Um, actually, this is not species. This is a genus, not a species, to be specific. But um, these are the main ones. They're non-virulent strains. Um, or non-virulent species of these strains. Um, they do recommend them currently for various bowel disorders. Uh, next slide. Um, there's something known as um, symbiotic therapy, which is when you take a probiotic with a prebiotic. Probiotics seem to have a very short half-life. So when you take a prebiotic, which is a non-digestible food ingredient, um, it seems to allow the probiotic to hang around longer. Um, we actually uh, today use something called FMT, which is fecal microbiome transplantation um, that's used in chronic um, C. diff. C. diff is a bacterial, um, is a type of bacteria that can cause this terrible diarrhea. Um, and uh, FMT is now actually being looked at in resistant forms of immunotherapy-associated colitis. So if anyone's either received immunotherapy or have heard about immunotherapy, one of the dreaded side effects is this terrible colitis that can happen um, that requires steroids and all sorts of things. And so uh, FMT is now being looked at there. Um, I, I tend to use probiotics fairly liberally in a lot of patients. However, in the severely immunocompromised patients, which by the way, most patients on chemotherapy don't fall into that category, um, but uh, patients with um, more advanced AIDS, uh, HIV, uh, people who've had uh, solid organ or bone marrow transplantation, those folks probably should avoid um, certain probiotics, particularly with that species, which is strep, uh, Streptococcus uh, boulardii. Um, and honestly, probably best to just avoid probiotics altogether. Um, next slide. Uh, the list of herbal supplements, I mean, we could talk for hours about herbal supplements, but I want to just mention a couple that um, tend to come up a lot in my conversations with patients. Ashwagandha. Um, ashwagandha is safe to use. Um, it can be helpful for things like anxiety. It's been shown to help in uh, small randomized trials with fatigue. It improves sleep quality, memory, cognition. Um, ginger. Uh, can be used um, and is used often, and we have randomized trials to show its benefit in nausea and vomiting uh, from chemotherapy. Um, astragalus is used in, in fatigue. Um, phytoestrogens, uh, we can have a whole talk on just phytoestrogens and their benefits and, and whatnot, but to, to put it simply, for the most part, in most women with breast cancer, and I'll emphasize this, phytoestrogens are safe. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about this and soy, and I have women that uh, I treat, again, I only do breast cancer, but um, I have women that I treat who are actively looking at every ingredient of everything they eat and making sure there's no soy in there. And clearly that is not um, recommended. Um, soy um, is a phytoestrogen. It's considered an isoflavone. Those are the two types of phytoestrogen. Um, soy's main phytoestrogen is called genistein. Um, lignans are the other type of phytoestrogen, and we find those in things like flaxseed, sesame seed, cashews. Um, uh, not to get uh, too deep into, into this, but phytoestrogens, we think, um, not only are not harmful uh, from a breast cancer standpoint, but they seem to do some interesting things related to um, the axis between the brain and the ovaries, and potentially to put it simply, they, they seem to make the body think that there's estrogen around. And so it shuts off brain's production of the hormones that would normally stimulate estrogen production. And so there are some Asian, uh, multiple Asian studies where soy is commonly um, consumed uh, that show maybe a decreased risk of breast cancer um, in, in, or decreased risk of recurrence of breast cancer with soy. So as I tell my patients, it doesn't mean you go out there and have, you know, um, tofu three times a day, but soy is, 
perfectly safe to, to have. Um, next slide. I want to mention a couple of um, uh, symptoms, the common uh, symptoms that we see uh, that can have some integrative and supplement options uh, to treat. So first is neuropathy. So many of our chemo drugs, as some of you have, have likely seen, cause neuropathy. Neuropathy is an irritation of the nerve endings, particularly related to the peripheral nerve, so the hands and feet. Uh, but neuropathy can actually be autonomic. It can cause bowel issues, even breathing issues. Um, there are some supplements that I will recommend. The one on this list that probably has the most benefit is glutamine. Uh, glutamine is an amino acid. Um, uh, it's um, uh, often in powder form. You, you take it twice a day um, in water or juice, and it, it seems to help you, again, safe uh, to take. There's a couple of others here, the vitamin B6, oxalic acid. Uh, by the way, um, if you're not already, if you happen to be getting or about to get chemotherapy with things like Taxol or Carboplatin or these sorts of drugs, the cold gloves and socks uh, really work. Um, we're doing a study at the other site uh, where I spend more of my time, which is um, Holy Redeemer Hospital in Philly, where we are seeing dramatic reductions in neuropathy um, with the use of a very simple, uh, these gloves and socks you can get for 50, you know, 50 bucks on Amazon. Um, next slide. Fatigue is a tough one because, you know, tiredness, there's so many things that contribute, uh, physical and mental, that contribute to our patients with cancer uh, that, that can cause tiredness. So it is important just for your, your oncology team to check all of these things, some of the thyroid tests and other tests of the blood. But um, there have been some supplements um, like ginseng, like ginkgo, like astragalus, uh, that have been shown uh, in, in some uh, smaller studies to help. Uh, the Gs, ginseng, ginkgo, and garlic, by the way, the three Gs, um, all can thin the blood. So again, just anytime you start anything, I think it goes without saying, but just tell your team that you're taking something. Next slide. Nausea, um, you know, I, I, I think I first treated patients with cancer about 20 years ago, and I Remember back then, we didn't have the sorts of medications we have today, and so nausea and vomiting were a much bigger issue um, than they are today. However, even with all the fancy things we have, we still, unfortunately, um, patients still get the side effects from our treatment. Um, it is important for your team to know if it's related to the chemo itself or potentially, you know, is it related to brain, gastrointestinal system, but that's something they would, um, they would try to ascertain. Uh, as I mentioned, ginger is, is effective. Uh, THC, marijuana. Uh, THC is the psychoactive component of marijuana, uh, unlike CBD, which is something you can get at any local store. Um, THC, you need to see someone who understands it, understands how to dose it, uh, but clearly there appears to be benefit in terms of nausea, along with uh, some of the other things I mentioned here. Next slide. And then insomnia. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is something, again, as a, as a breast cancer oncologist, um, we often um, have to put women into menopause that may not have gone into menopause, or the ones that are, we often have to modulate their hormonal milieu with some of the medicines, and so insomnia is an unfortunate outcropping of that. So outside of sleep hygiene and, and all the things we know we shouldn't be doing, like looking at our phones and tablets, um, there are some natural products. There's one in particular which I often recommend, which is valerian. Um, valerian capsules you can get at any health food store. I warn you that they don't smell very good, so don't put your nose into the bottle. Um, but they taste fine. And uh, valerian in low doses is used for anxiety. Um, my 21-year, uh, almost 21-year-old daughter um, was having some issues with anxiety, and rather than put her on a medication, she tried valerian, and it really has worked. Um, well for her, as uh, many studies have shown it does. In higher doses, it helps with sleep. Um, I mentioned melatonin here. Melatonin actually is not a sleep aid. Um, I know people use it that way and it's marketed that way. It is a circadian rhythm aid. So for people who work night shift, who uh, uh, have jet lag, it's a great option. But it's not really meant to be for sleep. Uh, now, having said that, elderly people some of the reasons they don't sleep well is a circadian rhythm issue, 
So for them, it can have some value. Um, like anything, the doses start low. Uh, you don't need high doses of melatonin. Um, one to two milligrams often is sufficient, but more than five really doesn't have much value. And then this uh, sour cherry juice, I, I put that on there. It just um, it contains tryptophan, and there's some studies showing it improves sleep quality and time and sleep latency, which is the time it takes for you to actually get to sleep. Uh, next slide. So just a final word, uh, caution. Beware of those who invent a fake crisis and then profess to have the solution. Um, this is often manifest in expensive testing. So I have many patients now that'll come to me with um, these fancy, you know, 35 page reports of tests. There's, um, there's about four or five popular ones, but many others um, that measure all sorts of things in the blood that measure various um, uh, nutrients and chemicals and, and minerals and metals and, and some even purport to say that this cancer responds better to this treatment or not treatment. It, it's not to say that all of those are, are useless. They're, they're probably not. I think there's probably some value, but we want to be careful saying that there's a problem when we don't really know what the range means. Um, so these things need to be validated. Um, and just as a caution, a uh, recent study showed that 88% of people with cancer were taking herbs and supplements that were at risk for major potential medication interactions. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Nope, one back. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, uh, I wanted to put this list up, which um, things to really Sorry, I got muted there. Um, so these are things that, yeah, to, um, uh, to really avoid. There's really no circumstances where any of this has, uh, uh, um, you know, been found to be helpful, particularly those first, um, first six or seven on that list. So um, I'm not going to go into each of these, but um, Consumer Reports has looked at this. Dr. Weil, um, Andy Weil, is um, probably the most uh, preeminent um, integrative medicine physician in the country, if not the world. Uh, he and uh, Dr. Don Abrams put together the, um, the large tome, Integrative Oncology, which um, is all evidence-based information, mostly for practitioners, though uh, for patients who are interested there, there's a lot of good information there. But, but these are things that you probably should avoid. Um, the last one on there, selenium, I put on there because some recent studies have shown that um, when it comes to cancer, there may actually be negative effects rather than positive effects. And next slide. So this is just finally, um, you know, where can you get good information? It's hard because when you're on the internet, I mean, you could spend hours and get, go down a rabbit hole. Um, but these are websites, the, the NCI's Office of Cancer Complementary and Alternative Medicine, the Office of Dietary Supplements. The NCCIH is the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Uh, they have some great information. And then um, the most comprehensive database of supplements of, that is um, uh, with, for both patients and practitioners is uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, MD Anderson has, a, has an excellent one, but um, Sloan Kettering has really been around for a long time, um, and I use it. Uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and then Dr. Weil's website is excellent as well. Next slide. And that's all I got. Where am I? 1245. Okay, good. Good timing. So, um, so again, just, uh, you know, uh, I'll take some questions and, um, you know, just be, be careful, but understand that there really can be some benefits. So I think in conventional medicine, sometimes we are far too dismissive of things. Um, but uh, as long as you're careful and, and have done some research, um, there really is value to certain supplements. Vitamin C. You didn't Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Um, I'm going to open it up to a few questions. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead about your question with vitamin C. Go ahead. 
If you didn't cover vitamin C, is that a supplement that should yeah. be used more? No, no. So vitamin C, so I, I didn't cover, you know, I particularly didn't cover it for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's sort of two ways to give it. There's oral and IV. Oral vitamin C, despite Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes, despite Linus Pauling's, um, you know, crusade, particularly near the end of his life, uh, for taking 10 to 50,000 milligrams of oral vitamin C, almost all of the data on oral vitamin C suggests there's really no value. Um, outside of, of course, you know, people who are really sick and you know, been in the hospital for intubated and you know, that sort of thing. Now, IV vitamin C is interesting. Um, it's it's a, an area of a lot of controversy, and, and we're still studying it. The studies so far just haven't shown where the benefit is, um, you know, what types of cancers, what types of situations. Is it patients on chemo? Is it after chemo? You know, the concern with vitamin C and actually other antioxidants was that chemotherapy and radiation, they kill cancer by causing oxidative damage to the cell. So if you're giving high doses of an antioxidant, you may theoretically neutralize the effect of the treatment. Now, has that really panned out? We're not so sure, but when it comes to cancer, particularly in curative situations, we tend to get nervous messing with a formula that, that works. I think the, the exception though, this IV vitamin C, I would stay tuned on this. I, I think there's some potential there that there's some trials going on right now, nationally, internationally, that could reveal something to us um, in a year or two, not too far down the line. Okay, so taking a vitamin C supplement, one pill a day, is okay? Oh, it's totally safe to take. Yeah, as long as, you, you know, you're not taking high doses. I generally say less than 1,000 milligrams. Less than 1,000. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, because he takes a vitamin C, a vitamin E, a fish oil, a multivitamin? Mm-hmm. What else do you take? Uh, well, lutein, that's for your eye. These are all generally, uh, Dr. Habatros is generally happy with this. He said, just continue. Yeah, multivitamins. Yeah, I think the, what, what you're, you know, the list you just said there is, is safe to take. Multivitamins are the one thing that I almost never recommend. They're just not, it's a sprinkling of everything outside of people who are really, again, hospitalized patients who've been, you know, not eating for weeks and weeks. Um, multivitamins are useless. But, but safe to take. Oh, okay. Because there's some days when he just doesn't eat, you know. Sure. Yeah. And again, you know, for, for people who, who are not eating, that's a different story. But for the average person, um, really not necessary. Okay. Well, that was in from, the, thank you. You covered a lot here. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, yeah, it's a lot Dr. of information. Dr. Mehta, mm-hmm. there's another question that was posed. Is marine or regular mm-hmm. collagen powder okay? I'm sorry, is what okay? Marine or regular oh. collagen powder okay? Yes. Yeah, so um, I actually like collagen powder as a, as a potential protein source. So there's three main ways to get um, extra protein should you need it. So there's whey protein, which is the common stuff you see in sort of the weightlifting, um, you know, uh, bodybuilding uh, supplements. There's pea protein, which is what you see in the vegan protein, and then there's collagen. Collagen tends to be the most easily digested of those proteins. So particularly for people on treatment or who've completed treatment, um, those other two sources can cause more gas and and bloating. Collagen doesn't do that. Um, The other advantage is that it also can, um, it dissolves in hot or cold liquid. So uh, you can put a tablespoon in your coffee in the morning, you won't even know the difference. It doesn't change the taste, it doesn't change the uh, consistency. So it's a nice way to get a little extra protein should you need the nutrition, the extra, you know, protein nutrition. And um, do you recommend buying your supplements at a local store versus online? Because um, not yeah, that's a tough one. I, uh, so again, mm-hmm, there's, um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, I, it's not as if you have to have one of those three labels to say a supplement is quality. However, uh, if you have the label, you have a more quality item, you do not need to spend an arm and a leg. Let me be clear. A lot of supplements are an unregulated industry, $50 billion industry, a lot of profit there, and a lot of potential, you know, incentive for profit there. So don't be fooled 
by this idea that pharmacologic grade is any better. Um, you know, I, I I take a few supplements and I as long I have a USP label on them, uh, you know, and they're perfectly fine. Um, so, you know, especially with the financial implications of chemotherapy and cancer treatment, don't spend uh, money on expensive things um, that you don't need. So it's really finding, you know, um, something with that with one of those labels, and then you're fine. Can you comment on promise? Pomegranate supplement somebody put in the chat? Yeah, I mean, that's a more um, specific thing related to um, certain medications. Um, uh, particularly, there's some medications in breast cancer, hormonal agents and whatnot that we tell folks um, to not uh, have pomegranate. Uh, you know, I, I think my feeling on this is the amount of pomegranate you would need um, to have an impact on anything clinically is probably so high that you would never be able to do it, um, you know, on your own. So pomegranate supplements, I, I don't really see much value from a cancer standpoint. There might be other benefits that I'm unaware of, but um, I, certainly not something I recommend. Anybody have any other questions? What what were the three uh, reg uh, regulatory natural science USPS and the other? Yeah, and they'll share with you the uh, it's it's USP US USPS that's the postal service. Yeah, they're uh, US. <laughs> Although they may get you the supplements you need, but it's it's the US <laughs> Pharmacopeia so that's USP. It's NSF that's the National Science Foundation. And then uh -huh. it's CL, that's Consumer Labs. Those are the three. Consumer Labs, okay. Yep, independent, nonprofit, unbiased organizations. The companies, the supplement company has to voluntarily submit the product, though. Yes, So okay. they have to do it. Okay. Dr. Mehta, I have another question in the chat. Is hair and skin mm -hmm. and nail vitamins any good, and what do you suggest after one year, after treatment one year out? Um, so, a, a couple of things when it comes to hair, skin, and nails. So, I, I'm assuming it's the, the question relates to someone who got chemotherapy that led to hair loss, skin changes, nail changes, et cetera. Um, so, it, again, it's not like there's the magic supplement, but um, biotin is something that's been used for a long time. Uh, you have to take pretty high doses of it, um, higher than what you normally would see on the on a regular bottle, you need at least 10,000 micrograms of biotin daily uh, to have any real benefit from the standpoint of hair, skin, and nails. Um, collagen is, and this is where collagen may also have some value. Is um, you know, it's a component, um, you know, of hair, skin, and nails. So uh, if you are taking a little protein in a, you know, a shake, I, I always advocate uh, getting a good blender if you're going to make an investment. Get a good blender. Learn to make your own shakes, especially people on chemo and radiation. They just, you know, you, they don't feel like eating. And uh, rather than buy, you know, the insures and boosts that have a ton of chemicals in them, make your own. Um, you control what's in there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> is, is there a difference between D2 and D3? Are we supposed to be getting a combination of those two or just take D3? D3, D3 is the one you're taking. The only time we recommend, the only time we use D2 is when we're using the long acting. So in people who are severely deficient, we sometimes will give them a prescription, the weekly 50,000 units a week. That is actually D2, um, but that's a short term thing. Um, so for the most part, for the, you know, the vast majority of the public, it's D3 that you're taking. Okay, okay. thank you. There you go. Mm -hmm. oh. Are you, you're cold? Oh. There's one more question um, in the chat about beta glucan supplements. Um, do you have any comments on that? Not really. Is the, is the question pertaining to any um, specific cancer or just no? It just in said general? about taking. The question was exactly what about taking beta glucan? Yeah. Just beta glucan is one of those things that's kind of more recently come on the scene. Um, again, I look at that right now as a, it, it, there's just not enough information to make any claims about taking it. It's not something I recommend. 
Um, there's some antioxidant properties, some anti-inflammatory properties, but not something that um, that the average person would need for from a cancer standpoint. Do we have I think any I saw a question about fish for... oil. Oh, there was a question about yeah, fish oil. Okay. I think that popped up about dosing. Um, oh. The um, was was that a question there? I couldn't. No, but that's a good question though to answer. Yeah, fish oil. Um, so the fish oil dose, um, the the starting dose when it comes to the anti-inflammatory properties of fish oil is about 1,500 a day. So 1,500, again, remember, it's the omega-3 dose. So 1,500, you start with that. Um, again, I use it a lot when it comes to the pain, the aches and pains, musculoskeletal complaints from some of the hormonal therapies. Um, but you try that for a few weeks. If it's not working, you go up by about 500 milligrams every month or so, and so you go to 2,000. At about 3,000, um, you're really not gonna see as much of a benefit. And then once you get above 3,500, the US recommendation is not to exceed that. In Europe, it's 5,500. I do have a question regarding protein super food powders. Are they just as good as the collagen and the whey and the pea protein? Um, so the tough question, because protein superfood is a generic term. I mean, it, it can mean a lot of things. So if you're talking about a powder for protein, I mean, protein powders, as I said, it's whey, whey, whey pea, or collagen. Those are the three main ones you're going to see. So just look at the ingredients. I like collagen. I think it's an easier thing to take. Superfoods are a little different. So a lot of the super, quote, superfood things are just dehydrated versions of um, some of the vegetables and, and things you can get. So I, I tend to like the real food. That's why I think shakes, getting a good blender. I've had a Vitamix for 10 years that works beautifully. But getting a good blender that allows you to pulverize the food and just really, and not a juicer. And you, I'm specifically not saying juicer because I don't think juicers are a great idea. But blenders where you get the, all the fiber and all the, the benefits of the fruits and vegetables and whatever else you put in there, blend it up. It'll be smooth. It's a good way to get whatever nutrition you might be missing or not getting from your treatments. Um, any advice someone quoted about low white blood counts? Are there any supplements that might help with that? The simple answer is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, supplements have, have helped with hemoglobin, but not with platelets or white cells, unfortunately. That's just a function of, you know, being healthy and keeping your, you know, immune system healthy, but it's not going to help bring the numbers up any faster. I wish we had something there. Um, and then you already talked about the dosage for omega-3. That was another question. Mm -hmm. um, you don't happen to know any brands that offer the 1500 omega-3s? Should they check with their local pharmacy? There's no, there's, you mean of omegas? There's no brand that does 1,500 per capsule. The highest you'll find is 1,000 per capsule. Um, and uh, there's several brands that do that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'll just tell you, I take Nature's Made, uh, which is what you get at any CVS or Rite Aid, USP okay. certified. But, but do you um, take two pills? That has 1,000. So do you take two of them in order to get to the 1,500? But I take two because I get to 2,000, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, you'll see different different dosing levels um, available. So, but the highest you're going to find in one capsule is 1,000. Okay. So, um, Dr. Mehta, um, I have a question because I also take mm -hmm. various supplements. Is there a certain mm -hmm. time to take certain supplements with... Um, other supplements or to avoid taking certain supplements together? Um, for the most part, it, it's a choice, it's a convenience and tolerance issue. So often when people take too many together, um, it causes more just, you know, stomach upset, but um, some people can. I mean, I take a few supplements, I just take them all together, water on an empty stomach and I have no problem. My wife tries it, and no way, you know, she can't do it. So uh, the only ones I think time matters are related to certain symptoms you might be managing. So for example, if nighttime is when your joint pains and you know are, are the real problem and they're keeping you up at night, 
then maybe take your fish oil more closer to nighttime than, this you is know, than the daytime. Uh, what do you call if, it? Uh, if you're using if Ask. you're using something for sleep, obviously, you know, you don't want to take it during the day. Uh, but um, but for the most part, no, it's um, it, it doesn't matter. Empty stomach, as long as you can handle it, empty stomach is fine for most of them. Excuse me, doctor. Mm -hmm. My granddaughter is allergic to uh, fish oil. She can only uh, eat uh, white fish. And um, is D3 okay for her? Um, so those are, are you asking, those are two separate things. Are you asking if, if someone who's allergic to fish oil can take D3? Is that the yes. question? Because those are yeah. two separate things. Um, it, I mean, it obviously, it depends on what the allergen is in the fish. I mean, fish oil is a bunch of different things. The omega-3 is obviously the active, you know, ingredient, but there's fish oil has some other things in it. So she she would need to just, you know, figure out what it is that she's actually allergic to. If Sorry. it's, you know, if there's something in the oil itself, fish oil is also fat soluble. You know, so you get it in a, um, you know, fish oil and D are both fat soluble. So they, you know, if she's allergic to the oil itself, then probably not. But I would. I would ask her to, you know, talk to her I mean, allergist about that. An allergist. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everybody. It is now 103. I'm not quite sure if anybody has a last question um, for the doctor, but I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, do we have one last question for the doctor? And then we're going to say goodbye. Real quickly, I think I see something word? here with melatonin. Okay. Is that? Uh, oh. Email him with questions, though. What's that? You can email. The, the, the question on melatonin. melatonin. Yes. How yeah, much? So, so how many 20 milligrams? Um, so, so 20 milligrams. Um, so as far as fighting cancer, we're not so sure melatonin really does what it's what, how it fights cancer and what doses, but Higher doses of melatonin really just tend to cause more fatigue and, and, and mess with your sleep-wake cycles. So I use melatonin, like I said, only if there truly is, a, is a, a circadian rhythm problem, which we see in elderly people. In some women who have gotten chemo who hormonally have been pushed over the edge, um, melatonin can help with, with sleep. But I tend not to use or recommend doses above 5 milligrams. Can I give you one more question, doctor, and then we'll wrap mm -hmm. it up? Sure. Is vitamin D, is taking extra vitamin D hard on the kidneys? It's not hard on the kidneys, but what can happen is if you take too much vitamin D, it can increase the absorption of calcium from your gut, which then can lead to hypercalcemia, which can cause kidney failure. So now again, that's rare, but um, you know, so you wanna be cautious if you have a history of kidney stones, um, you wanna be really careful about taking um, you know, large amounts of vitamin D. As I said, if you're taking D, just have somebody check a level on you, you know, even once a year, but ideally twice a year. 